Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Royal Society of Medicine. This live event is part of our In Conversation series, and I'm Hilary DeLion, immediate past Vice President of the RSM. This evening, I'm delighted to welcome Francis Crook, Chief Executive of the Howard League for Penal Reform, the oldest penal reform charity in the UK. Appointed as Chief Executive in 1986, Francis is often in the media speaking on behalf of the Howard League, and in 2010, she was awarded an OBE for services to youth justice. Francis is a senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics and an honorary visiting fellow in the Department of Criminology at Leicester University. She has honorary doctorates in law from Liverpool and Leeds Beckett Universities. Thank you, Francis, for joining us this evening. It's a great honour and a pleasure. And for those in the audience who've not joined an In Conversation evening before, I should mention that I'm not the only one who can ask questions this evening. You, our audience, can ask Francis a question by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So, Francis, I thought I'd begin uh, with a question about the interview last evening on the um, Newsnight programme with the Chief of Inspector of Prisons, Peter Clark, who was warning that prisoners are being locked in their cells for 23 hours a day under the COVID restrictions, and that this is dangerous. He particularly focused on the loss of hope for those people and the impact on their mental health and well-being, obviously of great interest to our audience. What, what do you think about all that? I think he's right. Um, I think Peter uh, is, is very angry about um, the way that prisons have, have locked people up um, without, without hope, as you say. I mean, it was understandable at the beginning of the COVID, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, we were all very worried that uh, it would spread like wildfire through prisons, um, as you know, epidemics have in the past. But um, so, so locking people up in order to uh, stop that was, was reasonable. Mm. However, um, it's gone on now for over 200 days, and this includes children, um, some as young as 15, who've been locked alone in their cells um, day after day after day with no education, no activity, very little exercise, no work, and as Peter Clark said, no hope, because it seems that um, it's going to go on interminably. Mm. What the Howard League said is that what should happen here is what happened in France, is that um, in order to make things easier, to run prisons easier, more safely, people should, uh, there should have been an emergency uh, release programme, safe, um, safely done safely, so that people who are coming to the end of their sentences, who are going to be released anyway, very, very soon, should have been released a bit early. That would have eased the pressure a bit. And um, in France, they've released 10 or 15,000 people that way. Uh, that didn't happen. So it means that today people are either held for very long periods alone in their cell or perhaps just as bad. They're locked in a tiny cell, a Victorian cell with somebody else um, with pretty much blocked up windows um, for, to prevent suicide and um, a toilet. So they have to urinate and defecate in front of somebody else with very little ventilation. And again, that's day after day after day. Um, so prisons are really very grim, very grim indeed. Yes. And would you say there's anything we can do about it? For example, can doctors do anything um, because it's a, a mental health issue? Or can we as members of the public try and do something about this? Well, doctors actually have been very good about this whole issue on, on uh, solitary confinement. Mm. Um, we at the, at the Howard League, we're very concerned, particularly about the imposition of, of solitary confinement on children. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's as, just as bad for adult men and women, but, you know, we're a relatively small charity and we, could, we pick what we, uh, the areas we, we, we fight on. And we've got a case going to the Supreme Court, uh, which predates the pandemic. Um, but we worked with um, with doctors on that because they um, and the Royal College of Psychiatrists and, and, and do doctors and, and paediatricians came together with a very strong statement that mm. children should not uh, be put into solitary confinement. Um, so doctors already, I think, recognise that this is harmful to mental and physical health. Mm. Your physical health deteriorates too. If you don't get any exercise, if your diet is very poor, 
um, your emotional life is stunted, your social life is stunted, your intellectual life is stunted, um, and you just literally sort of pace up and down. It's, it's um, um, as I say, we're, we're, we're taking the case on children, but um, it affects adult men and women too. Mm. So, well, that's obviously all very serious. And um, now let's, let's move away from the present crisis and talk a little bit about you. Um, it would be good to hear a bit about your life and, and how you came to choose the career that's taken 30 odd years of your, of your life. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit about your childhood and family life and perhaps your ambitions as a, as a teenager and so on. I'm a North Londoner brought up in North London. Um, I was a child of the 60s, um, so, you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll, although there wasn't actually a lot of that, uh, sadly. Um, but uh, I left school early by mutual agreement, shall we say. I was always a dissenter. Um, I always wanted to challenge. Everybody goes in one direction, I'm going in the other. Um, so I, I went back to university late, studied history, and uh, became a teacher because I wanted to change things. But I, I found teaching very stultifying. Um, I wasn't happy doing it. So I, I was very lucky, got a job at Amnesty International um, running campaigns on human rights, which was an extraordinary privilege, but absolutely draining. When day after day after day, you're dealing with people who've been tortured, executed, um, and the things that governments do to their populations is 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 absolutely horrific. So I, I worked for five years there, um, running campaigns on all sorts of issues in all sorts of countries on human rights, um, and then found myself at the end just sobbing at my desk with photographs of of people with appalling mutilations, and I, I knew I couldn't do it anymore. So um, I I moved on. Yes. Yes. But you were at the same time, you were also um, the London Borough of uh, Barnet, a councillor and at Mrs. Thatcher's constituency, indeed, mm -hmm. in the where you still live. So what, what drew you into local politics? Oh, I want to change the world. I mean, you know, <laughs> so I want to make the world a better place. You do what you can. You, you take the opportunities that that arise, I think, to to make to do to do good. Um, it sounds awfully pompous, doesn't it? But, you know, um, I, I think local politics are incredibly important. It's interesting I say that today when we've, we've had a lot of argy-bargy about the role of local politics in, in, in making decisions about resources. Um, I really think that giving local democracy is incredibly important. And, and I was very lucky to be in a part of, of North London where there was a very active Labour Party. Um, and very active in, in, in not just in the politics, but also as school governors. And we um, still people are, are involved in running a, a local festival in the park. Well, of course, it was cancelled this year. A local newspaper. They have open art days. It's a it's a very lively local community. And it was it was great to be to be part of that as a local councillor. Um, I was on Barnet Council, but it was at a time when we were in opposition. I think there were about 18 of us. And, and um, so I don't think I achieved anything very much because we couldn't make decisions. Um, but it was it was um, challenging and interesting. Uh, but I'm a great I, I'm a great proponent of, of local democracy mm -hmm. and power for the local authorities. And is there anything that you would say you learned from that experience that helped you in, in you know, your your work and your life afterwards? Oh, I don't know that. Um, I suppose you learn techniques of campaigning, you learn about cooperation, you learn to stand your ground. Um, I learned, personally, I learned skills in, in public speaking um, and um, campaigning generally, I think. Um, I, that's pretty much it. I mean, I, I also, uh, it, um, it gave me a lot of, of support locally. As you say, I still live in the area where I was a councillor and uh, that local community is very important to me. Yes well in 1986 then you were appointed as chief executive of the Howard League um, so what attracted you to that particular job? Well it's called nominative determinism as they keep saying Gosh. every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it means I was named for it. Uh, Francis means freedom, crook means criminal so you know free the criminals. Um, I and my father was a, a prison visitor. Um, my mother separately married somebody who went to prison, was an alcoholic. 
as is often the case of people with mental health or addictions as your the audience will know if they know anything about prisons i know that they're full of people who have different kinds of mental health or addiction problems um but i think i suppose i think justice is the fundamental part of of, of a democracy of a, of a nation state how the nation state deals with people who challenge people who dissent people who break the rules how a nation chooses what rules it makes and keeps um, is is the, the the most challenging and the most important decisions that that we can make as a society um, so it's been a huge privilege to work dealing with those issues i i also on and off thought about being an mp um, and did apply in a few constituencies but the thought of sitting on the back benches actually it's a more privileged position to be head of the Howard League I have more autonomy I have more independence and I'm dealing with really important issues of national concern so it's it's um, it's it's a bit of privilege good yes well I've now I imagine that that people are thinking of questions so I hope people are now putting their questions forward so I can give you some of their questions um, and uh, the, uh, let's talk about how you would you saw the state of prisons in the 1980s. What what were they like in the 1980s when you started? Well, there were going on 45, 50,000 men, women, and children in prison when I started, um, and things were pretty grim. I think um, they were pretty much the same as they had been for the last hundred years. Um, numbers had gone up and down at various different times, but you know, they, they were, and it was also at a time when there were serious problems with people being beaten up inside prisons by staff. Mm -hmm. and that was happening in places like Portland, it was happening in Wilmot Scrubs and Wandsworth. Uh, there was systematic beatings, of course it happened to the Birmingham, the people who were accused of, of the Birmingham bombings, but of course were found innocent, they were beaten up in prison as well. Um, and that was coming to an end when I, um, in, in the 80s, but it was still a real problem. Um, I'm quite confident that that kind of systematic um, beatings doesn't happen anymore. I mean, there are all sorts of other abuses that go on, but, but that does not happen anymore. Um, so things, things were pretty grim, of course they were slopping out. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of prison officers who were involved in, in far right groups organizations it was not a happy state for prisons to be in it really wasn't uh president roger Car kirby has um asked a question about why is the instance of self-harm still on the rise in prisons and, and what could be done about that well imagine you are 23 years old you are a working class lad or young woman and most most prisons are, are male. Um, there's an, only about uh, under four thousand women in, in prison. Um, you have uh, maybe an addiction. You're quite fragile mentally, and you're locked up in prison. And it's frightening. And pre-pandemic, pre-COVID, prisons were very violent places, badly run, badly resourced, filthy, rat infested. Um, the way that you deal can deal with that is sometimes by bloodletting um, two people a week take their own life um, and have done that's been the case for years now mm. uh, so self-injury um, is is absolutely endemic across the estate for people who've never done it before and may not do it again mm. um, but prison itself is so distressing so frightening so pointless also so dull um, that people resort to the most extreme kinds of behavior whether it's um, hurting yourself or hurting other people yeah yeah um, I'd like now to, to move on to talk in more detail about prison life um, in relation to a particular um, in conversation um, interview that we had earlier this year with a surgeon, David Sellew, who in 2013 was wrongly convicted of manslaughter following the death of a patient of his. 
and he went to prison. Um, and he's written a book about the whole experience, um, which um, I have read and found extremely interesting. Um, and in it, he describes being taken to Belmarsh Prison, where his cell was designed for two, but actually accommodating three. It had a wash basin, a large open black bin for leftover food from meals which were always eaten in the cell, and a lavatory, a tiny cubicle with half a door from ground level. Um, and the curtainless window was partially open to try to clear the air. So when he arrived in November, it was freezingly cold. I mean, you've already said some of the things about um, conditions, but would it be like that today if, if, he, if we went into um, you know, a prison, would we see those sort of conditions uh, still? Yes, you would. And Belmarsh is a relatively new prison. Mm -hmm. um, it was only built, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, so it's relatively new. Um, the, the older prisons are, are just as bad. It's gross overcrowding. It's not so much the conditions. If you think of somewhere like Pentonville, which is, was built um, in the 1840s, um, it's actually, the building itself is actually quite beautiful. Um, it's gross overcrowding and under-resourcing. It's, it's uh, the, the lack of maintenance. And it's interesting that Oxford Prison, which was built around about the same time as Pentonville or Wandsworth or any of the others that, that, you, that are famous, um, Oxford Prison was turned into a very posh hotel. You have to pay extra to stay in the, in the cells um, because they've been done up very, very smartly. Um, it's, a, it's a luxury, to, to, you know, it's a luxurious place. So it is possible to maintain those prisons decently, but not if you have gross overcrowding under-resourcing and poor maintenance and just cram people in and cram people in without any it's not just the cells that are that are poorly maintained it's everything else there's nothing to do all day there are no workshops yeah. uh, there isn't enough education blocks the, the government has built a, a brand new prison up in north wales in berwyn which is for um, over two thousand men it's still not full though because it's been so um been so problematic um, it was built where most men have to share cells with a toilet. That's a brand new prison. Um, and that's the way that, that people are treated. And then you expect them to come out um, completely reformed, magically, um, a better person, magically educated, articulate, sane, um, without being damaged by this experience. Um, it's, it's, it's a bizarre way to treat people. It's completely bizarre. And so how, how can that be improved? What's the Howard League, um, you know, how, how do you say that that can be improved? Um, well, we've got a little phrase, less is better. Um, mm. we, we, we think, um, I'm not an abolitionist in the sort of sense of I want to completely abolish prisons. Um, I'm an abolitionist in the sense I want to abolish prisons as they are. Mm. Um, I think if, that there are people, and I've met a lot of people, who have committed horrendous offences and who are patently very dangerous mm. um, and need to be um, held in prisons. But that experience should be completely different. It should be somewhere where they live um, a, what used to be called a good and useful life, but behind bars. So life should be like it is in the community, but behind bars. Um, so people should be doing a, a full day's work, they should be able to exercise, they should get a decent meal. Almost everybody who goes to prison is going to come out. There are about 50 who are, who are not, who are sentenced to a whole lifetime, but almost everybody is going to come out. So we need to make prisons uh, work better. Mm. And the yeah. only way to do that is to have fewer people in them. We send far too many people to prison and for far too long. We have more life sentence prisoners in England and Wales than every other country in the Council of Europe combined. I'll just say that again, shall I? Yeah. We have more life sentence prisoners in England and Wales than Russia, Germany, France, Spain, Turkey, Italy, France, 46 nations combined. We are the prison capital of Europe. Um, so we send people, too many people to prison for too long and uh, we, we need to get out of this habit. It's, that's what's got to change. So what, um, we've got a message for, uh, a question from Catherine Royce. What can doctors do to get the, the government to stop imprisoning people with um, primary health problems and uh, the kind of thing that you're describing? Well, what I say to everybody, but particularly to 
um, people who have authority in their local communities is um, go and see your member of parliament. Mm. Um, lobbying members of parliament is, is very effective. Having, having been um, a, lo a local, um, locally elected representative, I can tell you, people coming to see you is very effective makes a difference. So that's one thing you can do. Go and talk to your MP and tell them that you as a doctor are concerned about this. Um, there's also things, of course, in your organisations that you're part of. You can get resolutions passed at conferences. You can invite speakers like me. Um, you can, you gathering together, you can get involved in your local, um, local um, structures of, of, of hospitals and doctors and things and, and lobby that way. Um, if you know people who are working in prisons or um, with uh, people who have committed offences in the community as well, um, talk to them, see what else they, they support, they, they, the support they need. So there's lots of things you can do at, at lots of different levels, which are really, really important. The voice of medicine is incredibly powerful, mm -hmm. incredibly influential um, and a very, very important. So, so do use it. Yes. Um, and uh, one of the the real problems appears to be for politicians not making changes appears to be public attitude. So, you know, what, what, what do we do about that? The fact that um, politicians seem to be, you know, afraid of making these changes because they're afraid that their public don't like it, don't want to see improvements in prisons. What, what can we do about that? Can... I'm not sure the public's that concerned about what goes on in prisons mostly. I don't think they care that much and not that interested unless something happens to them. Um, and if you if you happen to be a victim of crime, of your house is burgled or your handbag is stolen or something like that, what you care about primarily is perhaps getting your grandmother's wedding ring back because it was stolen from your house, which is not going to happen. That's, that's never going to happen. Um, you might like someone to be caught, which again is pretty unlikely actually, unless they're really bad at it. Um, and then you'd like to make sure that it's not going to happen again mm -hmm. and it's not going to happen to anybody else. Mm -hmm. But our whole system, none of those things are, are, are dealt with. That's not what the criminal justice system does. That's not what it deals with. Um, it's, it's, it, it's a complete failure in that sense. And so all those things that victims actually want don't happen. Mm -hmm. Victims are sometimes exploited um, and are uh, in order to lobby for greater longer sentences i think because their pain um is um it, it isn't dealt with appropriately mm, yeah coming back to david Sellew's experience of, of prison he um was concerned about the lack of dignity and confidentiality that was given to him in being treated um in healthcare treatment so when he went to A&E, he was handcuffed to two prisoners, uh, prison officers, one a man and one a woman, who stayed throughout the consultation, including when he had to pull down his trousers while being handcuffed. Um, and he was saying uh, that when he, as a doctor, was um, dealing with a patient, um, his, he uh, was dealing with a patient who was from, from Worma Scrubs, a uh, prisoner from Worma Scrubs, he insisted on that patient's right to confidentiality. So is, is the experience that David Zellou had, you know, is that a common experience? Yes, it is. And women also who are sometimes shackled to male prison officers. Um, it's also very undignified if they want to go to the toilet or if they, they're being examined. Um, it's, it's, it's absolutely humiliating. So yes, doctors can insist they have the right that in fact they should please do insist that if you are faced with a prisoner and you feel that this is an, they're being treated inappropriately or without dignity or um the lack of confidentiality do challenge it you you yes. must challenge it please do and is that an area that um the howard league has been working on to to encourage that to that change uh, it says that's the sort of thing that you might uh to in, you know that you would be interested in we, we have in the past, um, I helped years and years ago, helped to get cameras into the Whittington Hospital where a woman was being shackled while she was pregnant. Um, and uh, if you remember Anne Whittacombe and all of that, um, and it was on Channel 4 News and it, it made a big difference, but, it, but you've got to keep fighting these issues. Um, it's, it, it is something that we've made a... Um, the Howard League is also a law firm. 
we are a charity, uh, but we also have lawyers um, and we represent children and young adults in custody. So quite often if the young people are going out as individuals to um, get medical treatment um, or perhaps going to uh, a, a funeral, um, we've made representations and, um, on behalf of them to be uh, not to be shackled. Um, but uh, you often lose because the, the security imperative seems to trump everything, seems to trump humanity. Yes, yes. Um, Claire Halstead is just asking about should we decriminalise drug taking and treat it instead as a public health problem? Um, would that make a difference? Um, and, and how could that be um, dealt with? I'm very sympathetic to that view. Um, it, it, the Howard League doesn't have a, a formal position on this, but I'm, I'm certainly very sympathetic to that. Um, we, in fact, there was a, um, a senior police officer who came to our office just before lockdown um, and talked to my staff about what's going, what they're doing in Thames Valley, which is pretty much independently decriminalising drug possession. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a great fan of having independent police forces. I don't want to amalgamate them all into one because then they'd end up like the Met and we Metropolitan Police, we don't want that. Um, because there's some really good work going on locally in, in different police forces. And, and uh, I think it's very interesting that um, innova innovation like that is happening in places like North Wales and, and Thames Valley. So pretty much decriminalising possession um, and diverting people who need help in order to proper services. So I'm certainly very sympathetic to that. But I think there are some prisoners who end up um, having drug addiction. A lot of prisoners didn't have drug addiction when they first go in, but they end up having a drug addiction by the time they come out. So, you know, uh, how, how, can, how can that be improved? Um, well, it, it's like self-harm. If, you, if you're doing nothing all day and mm. the only person who's being nice to you and the only thing you've got to do, it's a, it's a form of self-harm. And it's the worst kind of self-harm because the kind of drugs they're getting uh, spice is in, incredibly dangerous um, and, and very, very damaging, can be very, very damaging. Uh, so it is a kind of self-harm that people in, indulge in. And um, it's also a lot of, of bullying that goes on. Um, if you want to make a lot of money selling drugs, you do it in prisons. It's, um, it's a, a huge market. Um, and the markup on, 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 on drugs is, is very high. So it's, it's you can't you can't punish your way out of drug taking in prisons or in the community you have to do it in much more in much better ways um, so prisons are just like the, the the community you can't punish your way out of it no um i've got a, a question here from uh, rosalind kartner who um is talking about the one reason for prison is rehabilitation um and if prisoners are given worthwhile jobs to do as you've already mentioned they um, that will be an improvement. And she suggests that they might supply the NHS with clean laundry um, and <laughs> work experience and earn a bit of money. What do you think, she says? I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, <laughs> actually, that does, funny enough, that, that used to happen. I don't know if it still does under, under um, COVID, but um, uh, they, there are big laundries in prisons and they do sometimes pro, um, do uh, laundry work for local hospitals. Um, it's one of the jobs that's, that's, uh, that people like to get into prison because it's hard work. You get to out of your cell, you get camaraderie, you get all the things that we like from work. You get a little bit of extra money, not much, uh, but a bit. Um, you get you know, friendship and, and working together as a team. And it's hard work. Working in the laundry is hard. I, I did four days working in a, in a mental hospital laundry when I was a, a teenager. It was really hard. I only managed four days. Um, so I, I think it's a good idea. Um, but if you're going to have work in prisons, um, people have to be paid properly and treated properly because mm -hmm. at the moment work in prisons is treated like, you know, you get pocket money. So what it shows is mostly is that work is boring and dull and pays badly and crime is much more exciting and pays better. So we, we've got to um, change the whole way that prisons are run and, and actually make working part of the daily life. Mm. And uh, I've got a question from Aaron Fabro, who who's, um, wants to know what makes a good prison officer? 
<laughs> obviously, um, the, the prisoners need good prison officers if the prisons are going to be run in a, a sort of reasonable way, don't they? So how do we get the best people for this job and what makes a good prison officer? It's an interesting question. Um, we, we've got a kind of hybrid system in this country where we haven't really under, un, made up our mind what we want prison officers to do and to be. Um, in some countries, like I've, I've been to prisons in, in Germany um, uh, or Spain, where uh, prison officers are turnkeys. They're in uniform and they're about security and they don't do anything else. Um, and the prisons are run by psychologists, by psychiatrists, by teachers, uh, by medical people, um, pedagogues, all sorts of people, professionals. Um, on the other hand, in somewhere like Norway and what's happening now in Scotland, prison officers are degree trained. It's uh, um, like a nurse. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a professional degree that you get to train yourself, a vocational degree. Um, here, we expect prison officers to be a, um, recruited and they will take pretty much anyone because they're desperate for prison staff um, who may have been um, on a security guard or a, on the, working in, in a, a supermarket. Um, you don't have to have a single GCSE. Um, it helps if you can read and write, but it's not essential. Uh, and yet they're asked to do a very complicated job dealing with people who are very challenging Mm. often very bright or very needy um, or have serious mental health problems or who you know a wide range of people but often very extreme people um, in desperately challenging circumstances and they're expected to do that with a few weeks training mm. and a very few layers of management in order to support them yeah. um, and they get very angry <laughs> Um, and and right, quite rightly. So I, I th what we should do, I think, is make up our mind. Either have um, a uniform discipline service with professionals running the, the prison or um, an edu educate our, our, our prison officers so that they, um, they can do a, a, a proper job, as I say, rather like nursing. That would be my analogy. Bill Jesson and lots of other people following him have been asking questions about uh, what the UK can learn from the approaches to penal reform adopted by other countries. So let's now hear some of the ones that are doing well. There aren't that many. Um, oh, right. Um, people always talk about Norway, but actually Norway is, 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 is an interesting, it's a very small country, obviously. Um, and it's an interesting place because it, um, it, it did have uh, uh, very few prisoners, but it's now uh, got a, a lot and um, it's outsourcing its prisoners to Holland. So Holland has got very few prisoners, but lots of prisons. So they're now filling them up with Norwegians or in fact foreign nationals that the Norwegians are imprisoning. Um, so basically, I think if you look, there's things to learn from every country in Europe. They're all getting it slightly better than we are. We're, pre we're not getting much right at all. Um, I would say, uh, I mean, Germany, France, Italy, all those countries have lower use of prison than us. Um, they also have a higher um, age of criminal responsibility. So they don't put children in prison like we do. Uh, we still have a lot of children in custody and some in prisons, um, awful places. So you, we can learn a lot from, from Europe. Um, there are also historic examples of, of good practice in the United States. Um, I don't usually say we can learn much from the United States, but there are some things. Um, there was a, a, an interesting man in uh, Massachusetts who was put in charge of the, the young people's prisons there. And he was so horrified at what he saw, he closed them all down. Now, he, he, it's a difficult thing because you have strong unions who um, have uh, a vested interest in the employment of their staff. So he couldn't redeploy everybody quickly. So he, he kept the staff on. So the institutions ran um, very smoothly, but they just didn't have any children in them. Uh, they only had staff. And very slowly he moved the, the staff out, but uh, there's a way to get them on side. So it, it is possible to change things. It takes time, it takes political will, it takes guts. Um, 
but so we can learn from other countries it just seems that we're not willing to do that although as, as i said i'd look at scotland which is, is trying desperately to do things dis differently uh, to um, change the system for women and uh, to educate their workforce um, trying to reduce the use of prison um, is proving very challenging but they are trying to Mm. I was actually going to ask you about uh, women because we've concentrated up to now on, on men, although you have mentioned uh, women. Uh, but first of all, I was wanting to ask you about the impact of prison on families, on the women who are outside and their families, mm. because that's that's obviously a major issue, isn't it? Indeed. I mean, you've got you know, I don't know, 70 thousand men in prison um, at any one time. Mm. Not all of them, of course, will have families. Um, increasingly, the the, um, the men, there's uh, something like 15,000 men in prison who've committed uh, sex offences. And few of them have families who stay with them. So it, that's a, a, and that's a growing part of the population. Mm. But even so, um, a, a lot of the, the, the male prisoners will have, will have women or, or, or male partners, uh, mostly women out there, who, who support them. And it is a huge thing to ask to trail across the country, uh, to sit, uh, to be searched, to sit in a in a in a, um, a visit hall. I've only once done a social visit with somebody, and sitting across somebody for two hours, where you can't touch them, uh, where you have to just sit and talk to them. It's it's not it's not what people do. Nobody just sits there and talks to somebody. I mean, you do it meals and things, but, but you're doing something else and there are other people around. It's a very strange environment and it's, it's asking a lot. And then of course, the families have to take somebody back maybe months or possibly even years after they've been in prison where they've been changed. They have been brutalized. You'd have to take your man back into your house. The children have to accept the father again you have to take him back into your bed, into your emotional life, into your family life. Having hardly had any contact with him or any meaningful or family contact, mm. uh, maybe for years. It's, it's no surprise that a lot of families simply don't last that uh, because it's asking, it's asking too much. And um, how has the, the Howard League sought to Im improve this? I mean, uh, you've presumably done a lot of work on trying to improve this, but, but how? Well, um, we do. I mean, I mean there are organisations that work specifically with families. Um, I've, uh, we've, we've been doing a lot recently um, on um, trying to get family visits reinstated. They were very slowly being reinstated. Um, but um, they've all stopped again, I think, now in the last few days. Um, so we, we talk about policy. I mean, most of our work is, is to do with policy. We're not a, I mean, yeah. apart from the legal work, which yeah. we, we do in, with indiv individual young people, we, uh, it, it's policy that we talk about, so it's practice. So I will talk to ministers about visits. I will, we will liaise with other organisations, sister or charities and other organisations on issues to do with um, outside contact with uh, the way that prisons are run um, and the resettlement issues. Um, most of our work, I have to say, is rather than sort of making things better inside and catching people when they come out, it's trying to stop people going in in the first place. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's stemming the flow into the prisons. That's tended to be most of a concentrating of our work. I mean, I, I should just say the Howard League is, is you know, noisy, but <laughs> we, um, I, I have 18 staff. Um, you know, we're, we're a small organization. So we have to pick and choose our fights um, and pick and choose where we can do things that nobody else is doing. Um, but there's an important issue where we can bring expertise um, which is different to what other people are doing. So we will work with other organisations. Um, I mean, we're doing some work at the moment with Liberty and with um, just the, um, the, the children's organisations um, and, and sometimes family organisations too. But um, it's, so it's supporting them as much as anything else. 
I've got a question here from Adrian Hutchins, who would like to understand um, what your relationship with the Prison Office Officers Association is like. Do they support? How are they, you know, are they helpful? Intermittent. <laughs> it depends. At the moment, it's not good. I have to admit, um, I think they are going through a bad phase. I think it's, and I, uh, Peter Clark made a, 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 a in his um, interview in, in Newsnight, uh, was very critical of what the Prison Office Association is saying at the moment, and I agree with him. I think it's that they're saying that, um, and they put out statements to say that um, prisons should be just be locked up all the time. Um, and I think that's really wrong. Um, and I, I, so I'm at the, at the moment, the POA is, is uh, we're not getting on. That's not been the case in the past. Um, sometimes they, they, you know, I'm, I'm a trade unionist by background. Um, I have worked very closely with the POA and the Prison Governors Association and with, and with other trade unions and professional associations. But at the moment, I think the POA is um, disappointing and I'm being careful in my words there. Yes. Um, Vincent Davidson has asked a question about what it's like for a child to visit a parent in prison. Um, what's the experience like and, and can it be improved? Absolutely grim. Uh, a lot of prisoners won't have their, their, their children visit at all because it's, it's such a traumatic experience. Um, it's, you know, being searched by prison officers in uniforms with keys and, and, and having to wait and then seeing your father or mother uh, treated disrespectfully is absolutely traumatic. Um, some years ago we worked with um, Holloway Prison when it was open, it's, it's been closed now, um, to set up all day visits and they were rolled out across uh, prisons and, and that was one of the things I was very proud of that uh, we helped to set up in Holloway uh, a system where the, the kids could come in on a Sunday and prison officers were not in, didn't wear uniform, the kids weren't searched and of course one thing they had in Holloway was a swimming pool which is great um, and it meant the kids could swim with their mums so you were very close contact it was very love it allowed a really loving and, and, and tactile um, experience. They also opened up the whole education department and it was very free-flowing. I mean the thing about women is they're not dangerous, they're not going to hurt anybody. Um, so it was it was possible to do it with women um, and so the kids would draw pictures, they lie on the floor and paint and, and it was and uh, and the, the worst thing was at the end when the kids had to be literally dragged off their mother and everybody would cry, the mothers would cry, the kids would cry, the staff would cry, everybody would cry. Um, but uh, it, it did allow at least a, a decent um, a visiting experience and that was then rolled out across other prisons and it's still to this day there are, well obviously not in the pandemic, but before that there were prisons, even high security prisons, which were trying to do all day visits for children and, and make things a, a bit better. Um, but it's otherwise it's really, really grim and uh, it, it, it must, it's, it's horrendous for children to see a, a parent in prison, absolutely horrendous. Mm. We, did, we published a, a report some years ago, um, we talked to children um, and presented their views, um, gave them a voice um, to explain what it was like, um, particularly visiting mums in prison, um, it's really grim. And the obviously the experience of, of women in prison is different because they may bear children while they're there and, and have a baby to look after and that must be a very peculiar um horrible experience presumably to have a a, um, a baby while you're in prison and and um and have to look after your baby in that situation absolutely grim and um there of course there was uh, there were two babies um have uh, well one was stillborn and one died yeah. Um, recently, this year, yeah. um, the, a baby was born to a woman in um, Bronzefield and she was, she gave birth alone in her cell and the baby was, baby died. Mm. Um, the, there are a lot of investigations into how that happened. Um, and the, another woman um, gave birth to a stillborn child as well. Um, so it's, but if you have a, a child in a young baby, it's you have to apply, you have to ask to keep your child with you, you have to be given a place. 
Um, sometimes they, they're, they're handed out um, if, if you've given birth and, and then you have to apply for them to come back in, by which time you're not breastfeeding anymore. Um, it's um, inhumane. Yes. Cruel. Absolutely. absolutely. And um, to the general issue about um, prisoners who come out of prison and um, they're very rapidly returned and, and the, the fact that we have so many people who um, are just part of a circular prison system and, and how, how do we break that cycle? Um, the people you step over in the street, the homeless people, most of them have been in prison. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vicious circle. Um, most people who are, who are sent to prison have been in before, often many times. Um, and um, I know that the government is very keen on um, doing something about reducing reoffending and improving resettlement. The trouble is that the things that, that help people live a good and law-abiding life are somewhere to live, somewhere nice to live, not a hostel, a home, to have a home, someone to love and something to do. It, you know, this is, this is the human condition. This is what we want. But if you brutalise people so badly in prison and you infantilise them, no matter what kind of basic training or things you give them, you know, industrial cleaning or whatever, and then you put them in a hostel when they come out, they are so unable to cope. Um, the, something like three quarters um, of the people who come out of prison are not in employment in a year's time. I'll, I'll give you an example. I was in a prison not long, not long before the lockdown and they were doing a training course on bricklaying, which is actually a really good thing to do. You know, we need bricklayers. That's a great job. It's well paid. It's, it's well organized. Um, it's, it's skilled. Um, and I, I watched this and they were they're, 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 while I was there for an hour in this, this, he laid one brick. He laid it very beautifully and it was very nicely done. But this is not going to get him a job. It's not real life. Mm -hmm. The training they do for an hour and a half um, on, on four or five sessions a week. Otherwise, they don't. They don't have pajamas in prison. They don't have breakfast in prison. You get a breakfast pack at night. So you eat it at night. So you've got up in the morning. You haven't had a shower. You haven't had a, a, a wash and brush your teeth. You haven't had breakfast. You haven't changed your clothes. You pootle along. You do a bit of training for an hour and a half and then you, you know, go back and have lunch and you go lie in your butt in your filthy bunk, in your filthy clothes for two or three hours. And then you go and do another hour and a half. And then maybe in the evening you might play pool for an hour and then you lie in your filthy bunk again. Mm. And that's for four and a half days a week. So mm. this is not preparing people for release. No. This is not giving people structure. Most people have not had, had a, a paid job when they go into prison um, and, and they're not going to get one when they come out. Mm. So it's prison itself that has to change. No matter how many resources you put into resettlement, that's not going to make a difference because the damage you've done is so severe and so enduring by the experience of prison that you can't rectify it on, on the way out. And education, obviously, which the RSM is, is there to do with, yes. uh, with uh, uh, doctors and so on and health, uh, uh, health professionals that's not really happening is it in in prisons i mean it, it's the, the illiteracy levels the innumeracy levels in prisons are very very high and they're not better when they come out because they're not really learning so what what's going wrong with that well certainly nothing has happened during the pandemic everyone's been locked up so there's no no uh, education classes going on at all um even for children there's been hardly anything at all and uh, they've been given us a little worksheet shoved under the door and that's about it um, Prior to that, the, 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 there was um, there, there's a lot of money spent on prison education, um, on, on basic skills and numeracy, but it's very classroom based. I started life as a, as a secondary school special needs teacher. Um, and and the, it's very difficult if people have failed in education, if they, they, they have been failed by education and they're an adult, you, it's very difficult to sit them down in the classroom for a couple of hours and teach them to read and write. You can, and there are some fantastic teachers who, who do an amazing job in prisons. Um, but yes, you're right. The majority of prisoners have a very low um, reading, writing, arithmetic skills. Um, 
Although that is changing slightly, again, because the, of the increasing number of people convicted, men convicted of sex offences, who are um, across the, the, the class spectrum and the educational spectrum. So that is changing the population. Uh, you get a much more educated, mm. um, you know, they, they can be priests, doctors, lawyers, um, charity workers, all sorts of people. Um, so it is changing the prison population slightly um, over the last um, five or six years, particularly um, with, with increasing numbers of people, men convicted of sex offences. Mm. But education, um, I'm an educationist. Um, I, it's um, so like the, the Royal Society, it's, it's, it's something that's really, really important. Um, but most of the money goes into basic skills teaching. So if you want to do a degree or if you want to do something a higher education, uh, you have to get charitable support to pay for it. The, there often isn't the possibility of doing that in the prison itself. So what, what about the good initiatives? Because we, we, we're hearing a lot, obviously, about the, the, what's bad in prisons. But let, let's try and, and look, um, perhaps at the, at, for the last few minutes, at, at the positive things that um, are going on. What good initiatives have you seen in prisons that, uh, that might change it? Or rather, we, we've talked very much about um, prisons, but more generally, you know, what are the good initiatives that are about improving the way we deal with people who are offending? Um, women's centres. Yeah. Um, there are about 50 women's centres across the country, outside, not in prisons, um, and they, uh, they're they run by voluntary organisations, but they take money, they, they take a patchwork of funding from local authorities, from drug services, from health services, um, for, and from the, the um, justice agencies as well. So they women who are uh, convicted of uh, offences have got somewhere to go but they're also women who are on the on the fringes of offence so they can be referred by the police if they've been arrested or come into contact with the police um, and they're all different uh, but they all have have some things in common they they're all a building so there's somewhere for women to be that's safe and it's just for women and they uh, they will have book clubs and they'll have a washing machine and they'll have they'll help you with your debt or with domestic violence you'll help with housing so they have a wraparound service as well as dealing with the offending they actually help you as a person and whatever your needs are um, and they're fantastic and the success is great there's nothing like that for men and there needs to be mm -hmm. uh, because that can keep women out of trouble it can help them resolve problems that they have and it can give long-term support because you don't have to be sent there formally you can just roll up um, and they, they 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 hug you they give you a big hug and uh, help help sort you out and uh, without um, judgment not without punishment so that is the success story the, the other success in the prison system is grendon which is the one prison that works it's um, an extraordinary place that's been around for about 40 years and no one's ever heard of um it's and it's the only prison that works it's a democratic therapeutic environment so it's a therapeutic prison for men who've committed serious violence sometimes sex offenses um, and who are serving long sentences but the reoffending rate is is minuscule Whereas the the very offending rate for every other prison is is sixty yeah, percent. And so, why do you think um, governments are not saying, "Well, that's a good way of doing it"? Why why aren't we then spreading that out and doing it um, in other prisons? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> it's bizarre. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, you've got we've got something that works. It's difficult though. It's for, for long sentence prisoners because you have to go there for a few years, you know, and it's it's very demand. Not everybody can hack it. it it's asking a lot. A therapeutic environment is really really challenging. Mm. Um, but but yeah, if, and if I think if you're going to send people to prison, it should be only the few who commit a series of violent offences. Mm. And actually, Grendon offers a really good opportunity um, and, a, and a good template, and, and we need more of it. And Deborah Allen has mentioned the the restaurants run by the Clink charity, um, which she suggested great food, great food. Of rehabilitation. Yes. So again, she said, why can't we? Why can't there be more of these? You know, how many? Um, there are quite a few, um, and there's one in a women's prison too. 
Um, the best, the best one I have to say is, is in Cardiff. That's, that's good food. Um, <laughs> but, um, I mean, it, there are quite a lot of schemes like that. I mean, the, the, the nice thing about the clink is that it's actually very high quality, that it's, it's, it's treating people, prisoners well. Uh, so it's not just a little bit of training on the side. It's actually good work and it's, it's, it's good training. Um, and I think it's that setting a high standard and expectation of high standards. Although I have to say, in somewhere like Brixton, again, people are not getting showers. <laughs> They're not, you know, there are still 500 men locked up in the prison behind the restaurant who are not getting this opportunity. But I, would, I do think it is a... It's, it could be a template that should be copied. I, I absolutely agree. I think it's ex high expectations for people, um, good quality training, and uh, you offer a good, an opportunity then to get into catering industry, which hopefully at some point we will, the hospitality industry will, will you know, resume and we'll all go back to restaurants and cafes. Yes. One hopes. Absolutely. Now, Teresa Etheridge has asked, if you could change one thing about the criminal justice system, what would it be? Don't send so many people to prison. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly children. Yes. Yes. And um, we've actually received about 60 questions. So uh, although we haven't been able to ask all of the questions, I think we, we've done as many as we could of, of the ones that, that we've Could had. I give a quick plug? Yes, do. Howard League is a charity too. Uh, yes. So do look at our website, um, look at the Howard League website, and if you want to join and be part of the organisation, please do. Um, and then, you know, you can ask all, our, all the questions you want to ask and we'll answer them. Indeed. And I was going to say, what can people do other than the obvious thing of joining the Howard League? So, Thank you. Uh, but you've already given us some ideas of what we ought to be doing. So I think we've had a very thorough Ring, run round all sorts of things that are going on in um, the criminal justice system. So thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed thank it. You. I hope everybody else has, and I'm sure they have, because we've had these ex loads of questions, which in, obviously um, suggests that everybody's been enjoying themselves. So well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so thank you. Um, I, I just have a, a few short things to say um, at the end before we say goodbye to everybody, and that's that um, you've just mentioned that uh, charities are in need at the moment and uh, you haven't been charged, ladies and gentlemen, for this, this evening's fascinating webinar. Instead, if you wish, we're inviting you to support the RSM in these difficult times um, so that we can support others. So, as you know, the RSM is a charity working to advance health through education and innovation only by educating our doctors and helping them to innovate in the practice of medicine can we prepare them for and perhaps avoid future health crises. So if you'd like to make a donation to support this vital work, please go to support us on our website or follow the link on your screen. Thank you very much for your generosity and thank you for being part of RSM's In Conversation series this evening. Our guest next week will be Dame Claire Marks, who's chair of the General Medical Council. So we look forward to seeing you all again, and we hope you will have a good week. Thank you and good night. Thank you.